Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Fujitsu ETSD. My name is Jim De Palma. Uh, with me today, the background running questions is Mr. Rick Coster. Lurking way in the background is Mr. Rob Clemens. <laughs> and Chris is running our board today. So thank you for joining us. So let's do a couple of housekeeping things first. On your screen where you go up to webcams, if you'd click the down arrow, and click left, you can now split your screen and see me. Let me move my uh, mask. See me on the left hand side and our PowerPoint presentation on the right hand side. And right in between the two, let me show you here. There it is. Right in between the two, you see the three hash marks. You can click on that and expand and contract the screen so you can view this as you uh, choose to. Um, they'll be, we're going to use some PowerPoint, and then we are going to go live to the equipment, so we'll be switching cameras, so that's when you want to probably expand or contract the screen. So this is going to be a, um, uh, an abbreviated ETSD. This is normally uh, a full-day class, but we're just going to get right to the components. We're going to go through the components, make sure everybody understands uh, what the components do, how do we test them, we're also going to take apart an indoor head, which is what we would normally do if we were live in front of you. So if you ever have to get in there and do a deep clean of the unit, or let's say you have to replace the fan motor, we'll show you how to do that. We're going to go through a bit of a PowerPoint to go through how the, uh, how the system works, why are we DC, what's it all about with the motors and stuff. You know, a little technical, but not anything heavy. And it's important because There'll be times where you're going to be out in the field and you need to troubleshoot the equipment. And we're going to ask you to do a diode check. And that's where we start making DC. And you have to understand why we're asking you to do that. Because anything on our Fujitsu equipment that's going to cause an effect, meaning it's going to change air flow, temperature, speed of the compressor, and even in the opening and closing in increments of our expansion valves is all DC driven. So really, you're really not checking AC on these units. On some things you will, but 99.9% .9 of the time you're doing DC type of checks. So that's why we're gonna go over that so everybody understands. Please type in any questions that you have. Uh, Rick is very capable with this equipment. He'll be able to answer any of your questions you have. And if there's a really some really good questions to bring to the group, he'll bring that to our attention and we'll address it. This is actually a very good day for you to be here for a Fujitsu class because besides myself and having Rick and Rob here, we should be able to answer anything, right? <laughs> I mean, really, we should. I got two of my best guys in our group here, so we really should be able to answer anything. You also have downloads that we included today that you should download. Uh, the, we have the service tips in there. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also have a worksheet that we want you to use out in the field, even when you're doing your testing, because it's a roadmap to take you to each one of the components that we're gonna to test today. And the worksheet's gonna show you where you're gonna place your leads, and your service tips are gonna show you what values that you're testing to. So those are two very important items that you should download today and have at your fingertips. And we will also go over the Fujitsu Mobile Technician. So in about 90 minutes, we got a lot of information to cover, so we're going to get rolling. All right, so <clears throat> excuse me again, and let's get moving. All right, so we're going to go over our motors and power. That's the first thing we're going to do, so make sure that we all understand how the system works. And then we're going to go through some diagrams, and then we're going to go through every single component you see on the screen. The diode, the active filter, the inverter power module, the EEV, and basically how do you diagnose and how do you troubleshoot them. You're going to see my meter, we're going to point them out, and we'll go through the testing as best we can without you being here physically doing it. That's the beauty of the teardown class. It's one of our most popular classes. When we can be in front of people face to face, you guys actually do the testing. So as soon as we're able to do that at different distributor locations, you'll see us out there doing this class. All right. So let's get right to it. So electric motors and power, sine wave, pulse width modulation, what the hell is all this about? So in our world, what we're gonna do is we're gonna control the power coming into our equipment 
and we're going to convert AC into DC, and then we're going to decide, or our, our equipment's going to decide, how fast to pulse this to those components that could create an effect. So what's going to happen is we're going to take this AC sine wave, and that's what you're seeing up here. Okay, you should see it going by, and that's going by at 60 cycles per second. So if I had a metronome and that was 60 cycles per second, that's what's coming into our building. Okay, and what we want to do is we want to take that and manipulate it, turn it into DC, and then we want to control the speed based on outdoor temperature, indoor temperature, and the refrigerant pipe temperature. Remember, a Fujitsu system is a weather responsive system. So based on what's happening outdoor and based on what's happening indoor in the environment, the, the equipment is going to adjust constantly to meet load, all right? So we're going to take that sine wave and we're going to turn that into DC. Now, why do we do that? Well, there's our motor, okay? And that's an AC motor. So first quick question for you guys and type this in. Looking at that motor, that alternating current motor, AC motor, tell Rick what phase is that motor? And I'll give you two choices. Is it single phase or is it three phase? So quick type it in. Tell me what you think, because this is important. What do you got there, Ricky? Nothing so far. Nothing so far. Come on, you got a 50-50. Give it a shot. Three phase, three phase. Okay, so we always look for at least three answers and three answers came in as three phase and that's exactly what this is. This is three phase and how do we know it's three phase? Because there's three sets of windings. There's the A windings, the B windings, and the C windings. So how does this turn? How does this motor operate? We have rotors in there that we've wound with copper uh, wire. We now put voltage to the copper wire. We create a magnet now out of that rotor, opposite poles and the motor turns. And since it's three phase, what we're basically building is a sine wave backed up with another sine wave backed up with another sine wave. That was a very simple explanation as to what's happening. So if there's electrical engineers on here, they'll kill me for how I said it, but that's basically what's happening. If this is my single sine wave and now it's three phase, I've got three of them back to back and that's what's making this motor turn. This motor comes from the factory at one speed. So if you need an AC motor to be a different speed, you have to buy it that way. So this is what this motor is, is doing, and it's going to run at one speed. So what we're showing you here is there's your three-phase sine wave. So we got a wave in front of a wave in front of a wave. So every time it pulses by, there's another one right behind it. Okay, that's really what's happening here. Hmm, Chris seems a little wonky. Is there anything we could do about that? I guess not. All right. So now, if we're going to do a DC motor, what's the difference here? Well, we have permanently magnetized rotors. They're not. They're a, a rare earth material. It's actually neodymium. Uh, most of it comes from China, and it's permanently magnetized. So I don't need any power to energize these rotors. And since they're DC, the moment we apply power. All right, this motor reacts instantly. There's no lead, there's no lag behind or slippage as we call it. So as soon as we apply power, this motor jumps. Think of a Tesla, if anybody's ever driven a Tesla, you press on the accelerator, it jumps because it's immediate, it's really no different. And what we're able to do now with using DC motors <clears throat> is we're able to control the speed of the motor on demand and that's what we're doing. And we do that with our IPM module. So this, these motors come right out of the box, set for a wide range of speeds. So we're going to take the AC, we're going to turn it into DC, and how we're going to do it is we're going to start off at our diode bridge. So we're going to take the AC, turn it into DC, all right, here it comes, all right, so once we change that, and I'll show you how we change that in a second, we can control the speed based on our demands, all right. So there's our cycle, our sine wave cycle. And what we're going to do is we're going to change this with what we call pulse width modulation. And basically what's happening is we're cutting off the bottom of the sine wave and we're just leaving the top. So where you see where it says number two, PWM pulse width modulation, 
every single one of those rectangles or squares you can see there, that's the on cycle. That's the positive on cycle. And depending on how much power we're providing to it, it could be, you know, quarter to half to full, all right? But the space in between is the off cycle. So if we need a lot more power or a lot more output from our unit, that off cycle is gonna get shorter. We're gonna be pulsing much faster because we need more production out of our unit. We hit set point, our unit's gonna wanna ramp back as far as it can to run at the lowest amp draw. And now that off cycle gets wider and wider and wider. So we're able to, to do this by using pulse width modulation. So we're still creating a three phase sine wave similar to AC, but we're doing this in DC and we're doing this, uh, and we call it actually pulse amplitude modulation or PAM. So it's still three phase, but it's gonna be in DC. But again, we are not beholden to the 60, 60 seconds per cycle coming into the building. We control the speed based on demand. Another great feature when it comes to using a DC motor is the amount of work output or torque that the motor can create. So as you're looking here on the screen, you see two torque curves. One is for the AC motor, one is for the DC motor. And you notice that the AC motor drops off. So what does that represent? If I had my motor right here on the table and I had a pulley on the floor and I had a belt in between, I energized the motor. Now I put gloves on and I grab the belt and I put more tension on the belt. The motor cannot keep up and hold that torque curve. It's going to fall off. If I do the same scenario, but now I change my motor to DC and I do the same thing and I grab the belt, put more tension on the belt, not only does the DC motor maintain that work output, it uses less power to do it. So that's a win-win. I get more production using less power. It's another reason why we do this. So on this slide, we're showing you here some of our older equipment that used to use AC power versus now the same equipment style or BTU range using DC power. And you can see on the screen how much less power we're gonna use. So this is the reason why we're more efficient. We're gonna respond based on indoor and outdoor temperature and refrigerant pipe temperatures. And we're gonna ramp up and down. And by doing that, we're gonna be using less power as, as the unit's operating. So we're not 100% on and then off. We're gonna slowly ramp up. Once we hit our set point, we're gonna slowly ramp down. That's important to know because myself, Rick and Rob, we've been out on jobs. And if the contractor that installed the unit doesn't understand that, he's looking for like, you know, every time I turn it on, it doesn't come on 100%. Well, that's correct. It's never gonna do that. It's going to ramp itself up. We may ramp up to 100% and then you're gonna hear it start to cycle down and it's gonna settle down. And basically what I say, it's gonna simmer along. Right? So that's important for you to understand because if your homeowner is not used to the equipment operating that way, they may get confused and think there's an issue and the unit's running absolutely, absolutely perfectly. All right, so the charts here show you the difference between AC and DC. So I got to power up the uh, rotors on the AC side, on the DC side, I don't have to, permanently magnetized. On the AC side, you're going to have slippage and rotation loss. And what that means is Every time that pulse of power comes to the motor, so if you hear that click, that would be the pulse of power, the motor turns actually afterwards. Go, go. Or on the DC side, as soon as we send that power in, that motor turns, so it's go, 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 however we pulse it, all right? Big difference there and much more efficient. We can't really change the speed on the AC side, but on the DC side, that motor comes out of the box, and it's already set for a wide range of speeds. Again, that's how we grab our higher efficiency, all right? All right, so a little bit of tech here, a little bit on, uh, on AC and DC motors. I hope that's clear. Any questions on that, Rick? All right, all right, good. I guess I'm getting better at explaining it, all right, even better. <laughs> so how does this all work? Well, that's how it works. So now when it comes to troubleshooting your DC diagrams, you're gonna open up your manuals. We have service manuals, we have our troubleshooting manuals, we have our design and tech manuals. And if I'm looking at a DC diagram, they're, they're the same yet different than an AC ladder diagram. 
I love AC ladder diagrams. They tell you the sequence of operation, all right? And the DC diagram is basically similar but different. What it's also going to show you is the actual voltage you should be seeing when the equipment is in operation, all right? So we're going to pull off a piece here, all right? And this is out of the service manual here. And this is right out of the service manual for the DC fan motor. So before I move forward, taking a look at this, what do you guys think this represents when you're looking at that? I see six pin placements. What does that represent to you? Give Rick an idea. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> that makes it easier to read for me. Fan, fan, fan harness. Right. That's the fan harness. That's a Molex plug. That's basically what that is. So we're showing you your six pin placements and what this diagram is telling you is voltage readings at different places uh, on, that, on that Molex plug, which is really important. Plus you'll see on here, it says CN1 is my pointer. So if I was looking at the circuit board and my diagram from my service manual said uh, DC fan motor CN1, I'm looking on the circuit board for CN1, then I'm gonna see my six pins and that's where I can do my troubleshooting and my testing for the DC fan motor, okay? So again, found in your service manuals. So if we're checking this out, all right, I'm looking for voltage between, uh, between pin placement number, um, let me see, what am I looking at here? I'm blanking out. Between pin four, right? No, pin three, sorry, all right? So I'm looking for 15 volts DC at pin three, all right? And I've got to find my DC ground, which is on pin number four. So when you're out in the field, depending on how you're looking at the board, am I looking at it this way or am I looking at it from the opposite side? You may get confused on the orientation. Where's my DC ground? And you'll always find on for fan motors, or on the main circuit control board where we're gonna grab a DC ground, that, that pin placement will always be next to a blank. So if I look at here, I got pin one, two, three, four, number five is blank and then there's number six. So depending on my orientation, I look for that blank pin and where I see the group of four, the one next to it is my DC ground, okay? So if I'm checking between pin uh, three and four, I should be reading with power 15 volts DC. When I check between, hang on, all right, that's, that's what sh we should be seeing when we're doing that test, 15 volts, and that's a DC ground, okay, not an earth ground. Very important, all right, because our indoor unit is getting power from our outdoor unit and our indoor unit has a ground screw on there which is a dc ground so we ground to our outdoor unit and our outdoor unit grounds to earth so the dc ground is extremely important for you when you're testing and also for in our communication signal between our indoor and outdoor units so it's really no different than when you're testing your car you don't have an earth ground we don't have an earth ground in our indoor units all right all right, so we're checking voltage here. So between pin three and four, I should see 15 volts DC. I should see between pin three and pin six, fluctuating voltage of 160 to 300 volts DC. That's what the diagram is telling you. So it's really pretty simple now when I'm checking this out. If I don't see this proper voltage, it's a board issue. I'd have to change that board, all right? Any questions on that? All right. I'm asking you to explain, asking about using an AC ground. Yeah. yeah. Now, when we do this class live, I always get somebody in the room, I call it a DC ground, they'll say it's a chassis ground. I'm like, well, let's call it a DC ground so we're all on the same page, and they insist on calling it a chassis ground. Okay, but out in the field, you don't clip to the frame of the, you don't clip to the chassis. You have to find a DC ground pin on your equipment, all right? All right, so moving forward here, my next slide here, this is showing you an outdoor circuit board. So there's many voltages here. We have to bring power into our equipment. So our incoming power 
on 99.9% .9 of our equipment is 230 volts, all right? We have a 115 volt system, but everything else is 230 volts. So I can have 230 volts AC incoming power. And we convert it to DC, gentlemen. Anybody have an idea of up to how many DC volts we can have at this outdoor unit when it's up and powered? Any responses? Yeah. Not yet? Good question. It's a great question because this is a safety issue now here. And it's it's all about me. I need you guys alive so I, we can sell you this stuff, right? Uh, so it's very important. You got a 330 volt. 330, all right, we're getting warmer, all right? But in reality, it can get up to 500 volts DC. And it doesn't take a lot of DC to really cause a problem that can hurt you, but 500 volts DC can really, really hurt you or kill you. So you really wanna be cognizant of that. When these units are powered up and running, and if you have the board exposed like this, you just don't want to go in there touching things willy-nilly. You've got some high voltage. So you got high voltage AC and high voltage DC. Be prepared. Be aware. So a lot of the tests, we're, all the tests we're doing today, unless we are checking for voltage, is going to be with power off. All right? We're, we're providing power through our, our meter. So this is all the tests we're doing today will be with power off. But when it's live, we can have up to 500 volts DC. So when you're looking here at this board, I want to show you a few things on the screen. We're showing you right here on this particular board where it says CN802. Everybody see that? And you can see there's six pin placements here. And there's one, two, three, four. And I got a blank. So this pin right here is my DC ground. So I'm using that pin placement to now check any and all of my thermistors. So on my outdoor board, you're gonna see these different thermistors and we label them and we color code them for you. So if you had an error code to check the discharge yellow, the pipe red, outdoor blue, compressor green, heat sink black, those thermistors are there, they're labeled. So if I was checking voltage, this is what I would have to do, all right? If I was gonna ohm them out, this is what I'm going to have to do. You'll also see down here where it says DC fan motor, and you should easily see where the DC ground pin is. DC ground pin again. So on these boards, we have multiple places for you to find the DC ground, and that's how you find it. In your service manuals, it'll be called out on the board. They'll show you the location, the CN802, a CN800, and it's the fourth pin. It's always next to a blank. So if I'm looking this up, all right, where am I gonna find this information? If I'm looking for troubleshooting, it's gonna be in service instructions. And if I'm looking for wire diagrams, it's gonna be service manuals. A little FYI, if you are not set up, if you personally or if your company is not set up on the Fujitsu portal, and if you don't have a contractor toolbox, you will not have access to these manuals. None of these manuals come with the equipment. You're gonna get the install guide for the outdoor, an install guide for the indoor, and an owner's manual for the remote. That's all you get with the equipment. These manuals, service instructions, service manual, and the design and technical are only available via the portal. So you really wanna get yourself signed up for that. If you're not sure how to do that, you can send us an email. We'll send you a, a guide or at least tell you how to do it via the portal page itself or go to your Fujitsu distributor, they should be able to help you. Or if you know myself, Rick, or Robbie, you can give us a call and we'll walk you through it. All right, any questions on any of that so far? All right, so let's get to our components. All right, so the diode bridge. So Chris, at some point we are gonna to switch to this camera. All right, so let me get my, my meter up here. So we get going. So what does the diode bridge do? All right, well, it's a series of four diodes, and this is where we're gonna convert AC voltage into DC voltage. And it's gonna do that by clipping the bottom of the sine wave, and then we're gonna manipulate it from there with some other components. So a nice way to think about this, just like it says on the screen, is it acts like a check valve, an electronic check valve. So when we do our diode check, we're checking to see that we have voltage flowing in one direction, not in both directions. All right, 
And it's a pretty cool check. And a lot of times when guys come to this class, this is the first time they've ever done a diode check. Okay. And it'll be the first time they ever do it on their meter. So we're going to take this AC sine wave and the diode bridge, which is a set of four diodes, and they're going to be sequenced in how they fire, if you want to think of it that way. And we're going to cut off the bottom of the AC sine wave. We're going to cut off the bottom and you're going to be left with the top. And we call them half wave ripples. So it's a very jagged sawtooth sine wave. And at the peak of each one of those pyramids or teeth is dirty power. And we got to clear out that dirty power. And when we get to those capacitors next, that's what cleans up the dirty power. So the AC voltage comes in, it passes through the diode bridge rectifier, that's its actual name. We clip off the bottom of the sine wave and we leave those half ripples, half wave ripples. Go through the condenser or the uh, capacitor, I should say, and it's gonna clean that up. It's gonna clean up, take away the dirty power, and it shows a flat green line as the sine wave. It's still a sine wave. It's much smoother and it's nice clean power. And then from that point, we start taking it through the equipment and our IPM module that will decide how to dish it out to our fan motor, indoor fan motor, outdoor fan motor, our compressor, and our expansion valves. So how do I find my diode bridge? All right, Chris, we're gonna move over to this camera. All right, so on this particular board, right, we're looking for a single screw hole that's going through the board. Chris, could you help me out and expand my uh, my side of the screen, please? There's a lot of moving parts to doing these classes, guys. So there we go. Great. So I'm looking for a single screw hole that's going through the board. And I'm also looking for a plus squiggle, squiggle, minus. Oh, look at that. That is awesome. So there's my single screw hole going through the board. A little bit of a glare, but you can see I got a plus, squiggle, squiggle, minus. That is my diode bridge. And that's how, this is where we're going to test it. So I have another diode bridge that I'm going to put up here. That'll make it easier for you guys to see. All right. Let me get the wires out of the way. Get my meter in place. Turn that puppy on. All right. So what am I looking at here? I'm looking for that single screw hole. And I see my four pin placements and there's my plus, squiggle, squiggle, minus. That's my diode bridge. So in order to test my diode bridge, I have to set my meter to diode check. So on your meter, you're looking for that type of symbol. I call an arrowhead with a line through it, okay? It could be black on your meter, it could be yellow, it could be red, everybody's meter is different, all right? If you have an auto-ranging meter, I'm trying to move my meter so you can see the screen. Just one second, please, there we go, okay? If you have an auto-ranging meter, you still may have to hit uh, your select button. Everybody's meter is different, so make sure you know how to use your meter. But you have to have a diode check on your meter in order to do this testing. Okay? So in order to test this, we set our unit to diode check. If you have your worksheet with you, we can take you through how to test that. If the diode bridge fails, we have to change the whole board. There's really nothing we could do. We can't fix it out in the field. So I'm just trying to move to the next screen. Thank you. All right. So on your screen, if you look back at the PowerPoint, you can, we're identifying where the diode bridge is. All right. That diode bridge is going to be, thank you, Chris, is going to be right around there. And there you can see plus, squiggle, squiggle, minus. And we're going to test it at that point there. All right. All right. So now on the screen, this is how we're going to go through that test. We set our meter to uh, diode check. 
And the interesting thing is the first thing you're going to do, let me get my wires un untangled, is you're going to take your black lead and you're going to go to plus. And everybody messes that up when we're in class because you're so used to taking your red lead going to plus. But here we're going to follow what's on the screen and we're taking our black lead to plus and then red is going to go to squiggle and squiggle. And when we do that, gentlemen, we are testing. Come on now. We are testing before for 0.4 to 0.7. And what's going on there? I get nothing today. And you definitely want to make sure you're scratching in. Huh. I don't know what's up with the meter. Just give me a second, everybody. Doing the it's better to use the regular leads. No, I'm not changing leads because I don't have a million different leads with me today. All right, let's try her again. Okay. Put the black lead on plus, red to squiggle. There we go. Just didn't have a good connection. And I should see anywhere between 0 0.4 and 0 0.7. So here I'm seeing a 0 0.687. So that's good. So I go from the next to the next squiggle. So I got a 0.7. So we're in good shape. All right. Then we put our red lead on minus. Black is going to go to squiggle again, anywhere between 0.4 and 0.7. So I got a 0.7 here. Go to the next squiggle. Well, listen, that's fine. <laughs> and I go to the next squiggle. And there's a 0.6. So, so far in that direction, we're in good shape. Then we're going to reverse polarity. Now we take our black lead, and that is going to go to minus. And then red's going to go to squiggle. And what do we want to see here? I want to see OL. This is an open switch. This is what I want to see. All right, so I'm going to go to the next squiggle. I want to see OL. And that's what I want to see here. And our testing is done. Nope, oh, sorry. And we're going to take the black lead, I'm sorry, red to plus, black to squiggle. Whoops. I think I've never done this before. Red to plus, black to squiggle. And again, I want to see OL, and I want to see OL. So what we did, gentlemen, is we just tested for voltage flowing in one direction. We want to see between 0.4 and 0.6. So when we see that on the first set of tests, we're in good shape. Then when we convert uh, we and we change polarity, Again, now we're looking to make sure we've got open switches. There's no flow of power there. This diode bridge is good, all right? If you saw a voltage when we reversed polarity, black was on minus, red was on squiggle, squiggle, you saw a voltage, you've got a problem. You have to change that board, okay? A lot of times when we do this class live, guys will be checking their boards, checking the diode bridge, and the equipment we bring is not always good, and they may be getting some weird readings and they use somebody else's meter and they get a different reading. Always make sure you got a nice strong battery in there. If you haven't changed your battery in a long time, you may want to change it before you get out there and do some troubleshooting. Yes, sir, we got a question. Yeah, we got a good question here. Do the boards need to be disconnected to test the controls? Uh, for the diode, no. When we do the IPM, yes. When we do the active filter module, yes. Okay. Any questions on, on that, on how we did it? What? <laughs> Got some faces from the peanut gallery at me here. All right. So again, very important that your meter has a diode check. So if you don't have a meter with a diode check, you need one. It's as simple as that. Some guys go to, the, go to these shops with two different meters so they can do these tests. Again, if you have an auto ranging meter, make sure you know how to use it and get it into diode check. All right, so going forward, what's next? What's next would be our active filter module. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should have warned you. All right, so we're going to our active filter module. And the active filter module is on most of our equipment, our high-end, super high SEER equipment, the 33 SEER. Uh, series that we have will not have an active filter module on it. That's VPAM. And what the active filter module is going to do is going to take the power after it comes through the capacitors 
it's going to clean it up one more time and it's also going to stop harmonics from going back into the system now harmonics is basically uh interference it's noise it's electrical noise that can cause a communication issue with our equipment uh and back in the day if you're as uh, young as i am there was a thing called black and white tv and when somebody would turn a hair dryer on you get the fuzz across your tv screen that's an example of harmonics all right so that's what we're showing you here i don't know if you guys can hear the hair dryer but if the hair dryer was running you get some stray voltage going the opposite way rob is looking for the hair dryer <laughs> it's magic rob all right and that's what's causing that harmonics that that fuzz across the tv screen so that's what the active filter module does it's going to take those harmonics and stop it from going through the system so in order to test our active filter module first off we have to find it <clears throat> so let's see let me move this around so what you're looking at here is an eight prong active filter module. And it's pretty easy to see when you open up the outdoor unit because it sits on its own on the outside away from the main circuit control board. And it sits on the aluminum plate that is uh, all of our circuit boards are connected to. And um, it's got our wires connected there. So we're gonna pull our wires off, take a picture before you pull the wires off. So you put them back in the same place because if you, put them back in the wrong place and the active filter module was working, you power things back up, you can burn it out. The active filter module is normally our sacrificial lamb if we've had some energy or power surges, which could happen from the utility or it can happen if we've had an electrical storm that comes through. It's quite common. This is one of the main reasons why we want you guys to have a surge protector at the outdoor unit or either at the main uh, control panel in the home or the building, okay? If there was a problem with this and it was caused by a surge, what you will see right on the uh, unit is right about there, a burnt mark about the size of a dime. And if I open up the top of my outdoor unit, look down and I see that and I identify, oh, active filter module is no good. Okay, fine, that saved me some steps but I still want to check my diode bridge and I still want to check my IPM module because if I just replace the active filter module and don't check the other components, and I put a new one in and then power it up, I could still burn up the active filter module again. All right. So if you're looking at the screen and you're looking at how we want you to test this out, look at the values that we're asking you to test. All right. Between plus and minus 360,000 ohms, plus or minus 20%, between P and plus 720,000 ohms, plus or minus 20%, all right, 500K ohms, right, or above, where would you guys set your meter if I was going to do this test? Rob, where would you set your meter? Which test? For the active filter module. Depending on which leg you're looking at. You're going to do it that way or just going to set it for all of them? That's what I'm looking for. And ohms. You've got ohms, okay, but how many? I'm going with mega scale. I'm going with mega scale too. You got to set this above the readings that you're looking for here. So I got to be in mega ohms. You got one. You All got right. That. Very good. So you got to set your meter to mega ohms. Check your meter, right? So I have my meter set. And <clears throat> oh gosh, wires tying me up here. All right. So if I got my meter set, so make sure you're in mega ohms. Now, when you're looking at your active filter module, so Chris, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back here to this camera. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So when you're looking at the active filter module, those test points that you see labeled on our screen here in white, nice big uh, numbers and symbols, is not really what you see out in the field. All right. It's embossed in the black. 
It's kind of tricky to see. So you're going to have to look really, really close. So you would remove the power coming to this and the wires going to the different test points. And then you follow the tests that you see here on your screen. Now, what's interesting is when we do this live and I'm asking guys to test and we're looking at that uh, chart, if I'm testing between plus and minus and I'm looking for 360,000 ohms, you have your range is from plus to minus 20%. So you got to do a little bit of math out there. So I could be 20% higher than 360 and still be in the good range. I could be minus 20% of 360 and still be in the good range. So that means my range for that first test is from 432,000 ohms to 288,000 ohms. Okay? So you may not see 360, but if I'm 20% higher or 20% lower, if I'm within that range, I'm still good. Okay? So I'm going to find plus and make sure you put your leads where we're asking you to. So I want my red lead on plus and my negative lead on minus. Okay? And when I do that, I should be getting something. And today we're not getting anything. Maybe I should be checking my battery, boys. You know? Maybe I should set it right. There we go. <laughs> so 0 0.358, that's 356, 359,000 ohms. I am within range. So not a problem there. All right, next test between minus and N1. I wanna see zero on my meter. Would you guys please type into Rick, what does that zero represent? What am I actually looking for here? Zero, Robbie, what does that represent? Well, I know, but you're my audience. Open, Peter says open. Open. All right. Well, actually, it's not open. Zero is a closed switch. I'm looking for a closed switch here. I don't want to see any power. So I'm putting my red lead on minus and my black lead is going to go to N1. So there's my minus. Here's my N1. I'm sliding around. Come on now. Stay put. And is my zero, I'm in good shape. All right, so far so good. We keep doing these tests. So between P and plus 720,000 ohms, plus or minus 20%. So what's my range from 864,000 ohms down to 576,000 ohms. All right, so we put our red on P. Here's my red, All right? And we're taking, where are we going next? We're going... Sorry, what? red on P. Come on, Jim. I can't see. Yeah, red on P. Come on. Black is going on. This thing is sliding around. I got to take that into account. Black's going on plus. Let it settle down. We had a reading and then it disappeared. Here we go. 722 ohms. We're in good shape there. Okay. Next is going to be L1 to L2. That's 500,000 ohms or above. So red's going on L1. Let's find my L1. Don't cross your leads. Black's going on L2. And we got nothing. This may not be good, gents. Not all the stuff we're checking is good. Oh, God. I'm tied up here, Ricky. It's not in there? Oh, sorry. Hang on there. Hang on there. Okay. Here we go. So I had a reading. It's sliding in and out. So I'm over a million ohms. So, so far, we're good there, too. All right. Then we go from P to N1, so red's going to go on P, black's going to go on N1, so red's going to go on P, black is going to go on to N1, 362, we're good there. Then it's L1, L2 control box. 
So what does that mean? So I'm going to find my L1, and the control box is actually going to be the aluminum heat sink plate on your outdoor unit. So I'm going to go L1 into my aluminum, and I want to see OL, and I want to go to L2 to my heat sink aluminum, and I want to see OL. That infinity sign on your meter really is going to read, is going to be as OL. And then we're checking L2 to N2, L2 to N2. Oh, wait, Jim did it wrong. Follow what it says on there, guys. Red goes to L2, black goes to N2. All right, 800,000 ohms or greater, and I'm at a million change. So this active filter module is actually good, okay? So really the hardest part of checking this unit is setting up your meter properly. This is what we normally see when we do the class. Guys don't set up the meter properly, so now the readings they're getting aren't correct. Or they do set up their meter properly, and they're not putting their leads where they are supposed to be. As you saw me struggle a couple of times as the unit's sliding around. Any questions on that, gentlemen? All right, we're looking good. All right, so what's next on our hit parade? All right, and again, this slide is showing you why this would fail if there was a spike of voltage from a lightning strike or something directly from the uh, utility. This is where you would see it out in the field, so you could see it out there. And on this one here, it's an eight prong. Sometimes there's six prongs, and if there's only six prongs, you can only test up to six times. Nothing to worry about there. All right, you only can test what you can, can test up to. The other important thing you see here is how this is mounted to the aluminum heat sink. I do have a pink sheet behind it, okay? And I also have paste. So what we're asking you here is if I'm replacing this, and there is a pink sheet that this was connected to, I have to remove the pink sheet, clean off my uh, heat sink, the aluminum plate, re install a nice fresh pink sheet which is going to come with a replacement item all right then i have to take my active filter module and i have to paste up with heat sink paste that again comes with it from corner to corner all right you must put the heat sink paste on here so if there's a pink sheet i reinstall a nice clean pink sheet put my paste on screw it down and i'm good to go if there was no pink sheet on the job all right, you don't need to put a pink sheet there, but I always, always have to put the heat sink paste. So any board I replace, if it's the main circuit control board with the diode bridge and the IPM module, I have to put heat sink paste on the back of those items. And if I have to replace my active filter module, I must put the heat sink paste. Again, if there's a pink sheet there, I replace the pink sheet. And if there is no pink sheet, no problem, but I need to put the paste, okay? All right, so going on. All right, so next is gonna be the inverter power module. So we've taken our incoming AC, we've gone to our diode, we've converted it to DC, the capacitors store power and clean it up. Now the power goes to my active filter module, which is cleaning up the power one more time, stopping harmonics from going back, and then I get to my inverter power module. So as you can see on the screen, the inverter power module has its wires coming off of it, the harness, it goes directly to the compressor. This is the item that's gonna figure out how fast to pulse the DC power directly to our compressor and our indoor and outdoor fans and our expansion valve or valves, okay? It's on the same board as our diode bridge, this is the back side of the board. This is what you would not see out in the field because this is what's pasted up and screwed down onto the heat sink, all right? And based on the six switches that are inside this IPM module as they open and close, that di dictates how fast we pulse power directly to our compressor. You follow the harness, it goes directly to the compressor. So if I was having trouble finding it on the board, if I can find my harness, that's coming from my compressor to the board, follow the harness onto the circuit panel, and then I will find my IPM module, all right? And there's six transistors in there, so we do not use 
um, how do we call this? Oh my God, come on. A, th a, a three pole contactor. We don't use these things. We use an IPM module. So if you're looking for a three pole contactor, you're not gonna find that in Fujitsu equipment. All right? So what's happening here is we've got these six switches. So between U and V, V and W and W and U, right on the compressor is where we're pulsing that power to. And as these six switches open and close in varying, various speeds, that's what dictates how fast we're pulsing power to the compressor, and it's gonna dictate the speed of the compressor. So as the switches open and close, we're sending DC in a three, simulated three phase directly to the compressor. So what's also important here is as you look at this, if you have a compressor issue out there, we want you to ohm out the compressor, you're gonna ohm it out between U and V, V and W and W and U. And we never give you a reading on that, but we're gonna tell you that the reading should all be the same. And if they're not, now you've got a compressor problem. And if you do have that, you do need to call Fujitsu Tech in order to get a case number so you, if the compressor is still under warranty, you can get that warranty. If you're replacing any of the boards or any of the other components within the unit's warranty period, you do not need a case number. You don't have to call Fujitsu Tech. You can just go directly to your distributor and get the equipment that you need under warranty, all right? All right, so let's see how this works. We got a little video here for you. So again, this starts from where we started. We're gonna take our, DC, our AC power, convert it into DC, and we will simulate that three-phase sine wave. Okay, so the unit gets a, the unit senses that we need to uh, provide either heating or cooling. We're gonna slowly start to ramp up. Right? We do not come on at 100% right away. We start to ramp up, so we can be operating from 1,000 RPMs up to 6,000 RPMs. Once we hit our room set point, then we're going to start to ramp back down, and we'll run at our lowest RPM as possible. One other thing to remember if you've never played with our equipment before is once we hit room set point, we roll back down, and then the unit is satisfied. The outdoor is going to turn off, but the indoor fan will always be running but it's gonna run at a very, very slow speed. And we need to do that so we can capture the room air, the return air, so we know the room temperature, because the indoor unit is telling the outdoor unit whether to come on or not, and when it does, how fast to run, all right? So when we identify our IPM, we're gonna do these tests. So Chris, we're gonna go over to, the, to this um, camera. A lot of stuff to do behind the scenes when we do this virtual here, guys. And if you can open up my screen, please. Ah, oh, thank you. Perfect. All right. So looking at this, if I can identify where my diode bridge is, I'm looking for my IPM. I'm looking for P, U, V. W and N. The IPM is always going to be next to the diode. So I'm looking for P, U, V, W, and N. Okay. So on your screen, on the PowerPoint, we're telling you where you're going to be testing to, where, what your combination is going to be, and what value you're testing to. So when I test between P to U, P to V, P to W, I'm looking for over 200,000 ohms, and they should be plus or minus 20%, and then all three of those should be within the same range. Then when I test from N to U, N to V, N to W, it's the same thing I'm testing for over 200,000 ohms, and they should be within 20% of each other. What you'll find out in the field is when you do this test, you may be seeing 500, 600, 700,000 ohms on the P to U to V to W, and then when I go to N to U to V to W, <laughs> it may be a different number. But as long as those three are within the same uh, range and the top three are within the same range and we're over 200,000, we are in good shape. 
So I'm still going to leave my meter in mega ohms. All right. I'm going to put my black lead on P. Red's going to go to U. So I'm seeing six and change. I'm going to V. Again, six and change. And I'm going to W. Again, six and, ch and change. So with all within 20% in that uh, testing, so we're in good shape. Now I'm going to put my red on N. And I'm going to go to N to U. So now you can see I'm in the 300,000 range of 360 NTU and to V and N to W. Whoa, I made a mistake here. There we go. So there we're in the 300,000 range. We're over 200,000. We're in good shape there. So this IPM module is in good shape. Okay. Any questions on this, gentlemen? Good. All right. I'm going to turn this over because I want you to see what that screenshot showed you. There is the diode bridge. There is my IPM module. If I was replacing this, heat sink paste, heat sink paste has to be done. If you replace the board without the paste, power it up, you will burn up this board in minutes. Okay? Let me say that one more time. In minutes. So always put the paste. The reason for looking for the screw holes, because you will see single screw hole for the diode, two screw holes for the IPM going through the components is so we can screw the unit down and get good contact to my heat sink, the aluminum heat sink. And with the paste, the paste fills in the irregularities on that aluminum heat sink. I get proper heat transfer out of these uh, circuit boards. And as my outdoor fan is running, we're moving air across the heat sink and dissipating this heat. This is another reason why you always want to make sure the outdoor unit is clean and we don't have any debris or anything in there that can stop this process from happening. Because if I get too hot at my circuit boards, I do have a thermistor on here. It's the black thermistor. It's the heat sink thermistor. And that will turn us off because the unit's trying to protect itself if the components get too hot. There's a, a thermistor right on the compressor, the green thermistor, and if the compressor gets too hot, it's gonna turn the unit off. You okay there, Robbie? Yeah. All right, everybody heard you sigh. <laughs> I, was, I was yawning, sorry. <laughs> oh, I must be boring you. <laughs> no, never that, never that. All right, any questions on that, gentlemen? Good shape, Ricky? Good. All right. So when we put this all together, oh, Chris, can I have the, the clicker back, please? There we go. Oh, I'm sorry. So next is going to be the expansion valve, the EEV. So let me make a change. So the EEV, out in the field, out in the field, we can do a few things. Let me go back over here. So out in the field, this is what the expansion valve cap looks like. Underneath it is a coil. So we are going to be pulsing DC to this coil. The actual valve itself has got a permanently magnetized rotor on it. And as we pulse DC to this coil, that's what's going to allow the expansion valve to open in 500 step increments. So this is very precise refrigerant uh, control. So we can deliver the proper refrigerant as the unit is running. So out in the field, there's a few physical tests you can do. You can see this clip here. So if I feel that I have a problem with my uh, uh, EEV, I can go out, find the valve, and put my hand on it and press down. And if I hear a click, that means that the cap was just loose. If I press down and there is no click, then I know it's, it's on there. I can remove it and check to see if there's any corrosion in here. So if you're along the, you know, the Long Island coastline, on the New Jersey coastline, we tend to see corrosion that can build up in there. If I can take a rag and wipe it out and make it clean, then fine. If I can't, I'd have to replace this cap, okay? And then another physical test you can do is if the unit is running and carefully put my hand in there and press down on it, and if I feel vibration and I hear clicking, well, that means that I'm my 
components up at the uh, circuit boards are all working well. That means my diode is making DC, the IPM is uh, pulsing DC to co the, the component, but the bad news is, is the valve is probably stuck and we can't fix the valve, you have to cut it out. So that's why it's very important that when we do our connections, that's why we want flare nut connections. If you're gonna be brazing out there, you gotta braze properly, otherwise we can get some debris at our EEV and that can cause problems. This is why we tell you if you use a product like Nylog, you know, we really don't want you to, but if you absolutely have to, you wanna be as judicious as possible, you don't want a lot of it on there because if it gets into the piping, it's gonna take out our expansion valve. And never, ever use a leak detection fluid that has a sealant in it. This is guaranteed to take out your EEVs. And if you have a multi-zone system, you will be playing whack-a-mole out there on the job because one week this EEV is not working, the next week it's gonna be another one. So never, ever do those things. So this is why we tell you to flare and only use the POE oil on the face of the flare. Any questions on that? Because that's a big one. I'm sure. I'm sure. All right. All right. So going forward, so there's my actual coil. Let me back up. Hang on. I'm going a little fast. So you can see it's quite small and there's the harness. So out in the field, other than those couple of physical tests that I just went over with you, we're going to ohm out the harness. Okay. So this is a pulse motor driven needle valve and we're going to ohm out the harness. So again, we're checking for corrosion or anything inside that cap where the uh, coil is. You can see the actual permanently magnetized rotor right here. And this is a very fine point needle valve. That's why we can't have any debris build up in there. And this says we pulse power to it, it's gonna open and close in 500 steps increments for very precise control. So let me see if my video is gonna play with me today. There we go, all right. So there's my permanently magnetized rotor. There is the needle valve. And as we pulse power to it, as we pulse power to it, it should, and there we go. It should be turning and moving up and down in 500 step increments. So this is one of the things that we want you to listen for when you install the system for the first time and power it up outside you're going to hear if it's a multi-zone or even if it's single zone you'll hear tick 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 and that's what you're hearing you're hearing the uh, the eevs closing so they're shipped to you in the open position so be aware that when you're doing your initial setup you set everything up and you do your vacuum and then you do your pressure tests and then you pull and then you release the vacuum and put the refrigerant in then after all that's done that's when you apply power otherwise your expansion valves the moment you apply power they go to the closed position so you want to do all that first before you apply power to the expansion valve all right so on this chart here on this test we have to identify whether i've got a six wire or a five wire we're going to go to this camera chris And can you expand that for me, please? Awesome, thank you. So we're looking for either a six wire or a five wire. So this particular one I have today is a six wire. So I would test to how we see up there, right? White to red, yellow to brown, orange to red, blue to brown. Okay, if it was a five wire, it's a different test. You are testing the 46 ohms plus or minus four. So from 50 ohms to 42 ohms would be your proper range. Just set that for ohms. Nothing has to be high. All right. So I'm going to do white to red. And here it doesn't really matter where you, what uh, lead goes where. I got to put something here. So let's go to red. Let's go to white. And this is where I'm going within that window. Okay at 46 ohms plus or minus four. Make sure I get good connection. May get a reading, may not. 
to get my hand out of the way. This 46.5, so we're good. And what's next? It's a six wire, so I go yellow to brown. It's my yellow. Here's my brown. Same thing. What's next? Orange to red. Orange to red. Same thing. And then blue to brown. So we're in good shape there. So this harness ohms out correctly. Now, I want to point something out to you if you've been paying attention. You see these needle tips I've been using? This is what you want to use. This is a very tight harness. You're only going into this window. If you didn't have these needle tips, you had standard tips, and you force your way in there, you'll probably make a connection, but you'll end up damaging this harness. So you need to invest in these needle tips. If you don't have them, get them. All right, it'll only make what you're doing easier. All these tests that we've been doing, we've been going step by step and you know, test by test. This is literally in, done in five minutes out in the field. And guys that have these needle tips can get that done. When you don't, this is where you can't get in there and make a good connection. And if you are talking to your TSA at your uh, wholesaler, or you're talking to any of us here at Wales Dar, because we are TSAs or Fujitsu Tech, and we're asking you for a reading and you say it's good, standard, or normal, we can't help you because we actually do need a number. All right, so make sure you have these leads. Rick or Rob, you got anything you want to add to that? Because that is uh, one of the most important things we see out there. If you guys don't have the right leads. All right? Okay. Mas importante. Mas importante. So what we're seeing next, this is off of your uh, troubleshooting guide. Uh, one of the pages on the troubleshooting guide where we color code and we identify the different types of thermistors that you will play with out in the field. And based on temperature and the type of thermistor it is, we'll tell you what that ambient, based on that ambient air temperature, what your own value would be. So one of the things I wanted to show you is the different thermistors that we have at the indoor unit. Let's see if we can get a good picture here, Chris. All right. When this is all said and done, everybody gives a round of applause to Chris because she is working hard, flipping cameras, changing the screen for me so I could see stuff. This is not easy, guys. So what you're looking at here, this is right off of an indoor wall unit, and here are the two main thermistors. What I'm holding right here is the pipe thermistor. This is going to sit in a copper well, and what, what you see right in here is a little a bullet, and that's the air thermistor. So these two thermistors are sending information back to the outdoor unit telling what's happening inside and then the outdoor unit would turn on based on a demand and then we would take that uh, unit up to set point. So why am I showing you this? Take a look at this harness guys. Whoops. Take a look at that harness. This particular one is a Molex plug and look how tight that window is. And I want to show you this one because this has been through the ringer because they didn't have the right tips and they damaged the plug. And this is something you do not want to do. Okay. So when I would be out in the field, depending on uh, air temperature and or voltage and type of thermistor, you'd go through the test. So on the chart, we're showing you a room temperature thermistor and a room temperature thermistor with board. All right. Indoor pipe thermistor, indoor pipe thermistor with board. So if it's got the Molex plug and I can unplug it from my outdoor unit, I'm going to go with my room temperature thermistor and I'm going to go with indoor pipe thermistor. I would have to know my ambient air temperature and I would check it from the harness. So I'd really just go to this area here for the pipe thermistor and then I go to this side here for the air thermistor. And if I was looking at the screen, and let's say it's about 70 degrees where I am now, so there's a 68, there's a 77. If I went to 68, I would be testing the room temperature thermistor for 12.54. And the indoor pipe thermistor to, what does that say? 62.91. Out in the field, that may get tricky if you don't know the air, actual air temperature and if you don't have the components to measure that. So we could could check for voltage coming from the board. 
Ricky, is that 15 volts DC coming from the board? Five volts. Five volts. Five volts DC coming from the board. So if you're talking to Fujitsu Tech, they may say, hey, let's just check for voltage from the board. And if you see 15, uh, five volts DC coming to the thermistor, the thermistors are good. If that uh, voltage wasn't there, it'd be a board problem. You'd have to change that out. Sometimes the board, and I didn't grab the board that I wanted to. Just hang on a second. I think I got one right over here. No, I don't. Darn it. I forgot to grab that board. My bad. We also have boards where the thermistors are actually soldered to the board. And if I can't remove it, then I would have to go to the comms where it says room temperature thermistor. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Rick. Room temperature thermistor with board and indoor pipe thermistor with board. And this is what I'm talking about here. If you see something like this, all right, I have to get my leads in here, gentlemen. Whoops. Get my leads in here. All right, if I try to pull that out, I'm just going to break it and I'd have to replace the board. So then this is the reason why I'd have to go to a different column where it says room temperature thermistor with board or indoor pipe thermistor with board because the thermistors are soldered to the board. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Appreciate that. Any questions on that, gentlemen? Good. All right. So if we put this all together, if we put this all together, how does it all work? Well, there's everything that we just tested. So indoor uh, power is coming into the outdoor. That's at your L1, L2 or uh, terminals four and five. All right. So that's my 230 voltage coming in. I hit my diode bridge. Okay, this, so there's my AC sine wave. I hit my diode bridge, which is now going to convert that to DC. My capacitors are going to clean it up. It's going to go through the active filter module one more time. Now, information coming in from the thermistors. If you look at the bottom here, you're going to see the thermistors here at the bottom. That's the only arrow coming in. That information coming into our equipment is what's going to tell the IPM what's going on, and then the IPM will simulate a three phase in, a, in DC directly to the compressor and both of our fans and our expansion valves. That's what's happening at our outdoor unit. And I'm going to talk about those thermistors again because your standard equipment that you have out in the field, all you have is your TXV uh, and you have a sensing bulb there. And that's the only information other than a thermostat on the wall that's closing based on air temperature. But here we sense outdoor, indoor, pipe temperature, and the unit self-adjusts at all times. So we're gathering a tremendous amount of information at all times. So if our thermistors are bad, the unit can't operate. If I don't make DC, the unit's not gonna operate. I may still have lights, I may still have power, but it doesn't mean I'm making DC and nothing's gonna work. All right, that's our grand, you know, uh, accumulation of information of how this equipment works. Any questions on that? Nope. All right. And then when we get into our really high SEER equipment, our 33 SEER equipment, which is now our, uh, our LZ models, all right, you can see the only thing missing here is we do not have the active filter module. So the same sequence of operation happens but I don't need the active filter module because I am not creating any uh, harmonics, all right? Okay, so looking here, a couple of questions for you here. Looking at this screen, I need you guys to tell me two things. I need to know how many thermistors you see connected to this piece of equipment. So let's concentrate on that first. Right. And I'll give you a hint. Look within the green rectangle. How many thermistors do you see? Type it in. Let Ricky know. Four. We got five. Keep going. Keep going. Nine. Got a nine. Excellent. And there are nine. All right. Now, take another good look at this and tell me what size is this unit? or how many heads get connected to this unit. And if you can tell us, tell us how you figured that out. Ooh, bonus. Three, four. One direction. 
If somebody gets this answer, you can get lunch with Robin. Got a two heads. Nice, two heads. Can that person tell me how they figured that out? Two expansion valves. Two expansion valves. Excellent. So does everybody see all the thermistors, first off? All right, so we'll get there. There they are. So there are your nine thermistors. And then there are two expansion valves here. Okay? So this is telling me this is a multi-head system, and this would be my 18,000. And on all my multis, the minimum amount of heads that must be connected to them are two heads. So on an 18, you have to have two heads. On a 24, you can have up to three, but you have to have a minimum of two. So a 24 comes with three expansion valves. The 36 comes with four, so I can go from two to three to four heads. And my 45 comes with five expansion valves, so I can have from two up to five heads. So this is why this is a heat pump system and not a heat recovery because we are sharing the same refrigerant circuit. We just have individual expansion valves for each head. So that gives us a couple of interesting things. It's gonna give us zoning right out of the box and zoning is comfort. That's a good thing, all right? But this is why on a Fujitsu Halcyon system, this is your residential stuff, I have to be in all heating mode or all cooling mode. If I have one or two heads in different modes at the same time, you can get blinking lights and it's not going to operate. And that's the reason why. There's nothing wrong with the equipment. It just has to all be in the same mode of operation. Phone call to Mr. and Mrs. Smith. Make sure you're in all heat or all cool. And then your system is going to run. All right. So on these pictures here, we're showing you the placement of our different thermistors. So here's our green thermistor out at the compressor. Here's your outdoor blue. This is what's telling us what's happening outdoors. Okay. So airflow around this is important too. So this is going to be something to think about when you're installing the equipment or if you're servicing the equipment and there's a lot of bushes or arborvitaes or azaleas or something in front of the equipment, right? I need good airflow. So that's very important there, right? So how does it all work? The EV is controlled by our algorithm. That is the software. That's what makes Fujitsu Fujitsu. You can't tweak that. It's what's on the circuit boards and it adjusts the entire refrigerant system on demand. So we control the speed of the compressor, the size of the metering device, indoor and outdoor fan speeds, and each zone gets its own EEV. That's comfort, that's efficiency, and it comes with that right out of the box. It's not an extra you have to buy. So that's another important selling point when it comes to this equipment. Any questions about that? All right. So we measure with our thermistors, we make decisions in our IPM, and then we take action by pulsing DC to those components. That's what's going on here. Oof, my stomach, excuse me. All right. So we control everything with our software, we monitor, and that's how we operate, okay? Any questions? All right. So Chris, if we got, we're gonna stay with this camera, we can shrink up the uh, PowerPoint. And gentlemen, what we normally do live is we do take an outdoor head and take it apart. That's a great picture, Chris, perfect. Because a lot of times guys will say, or I've had guys come to the class for one reason only, how do I take this apart? I either have to change the fan motor or I have to do a deep clean on the unit and I've never taken this apart. And that can get tricky out there in the field if you've never done it before. So write this down, gentlemen. We have a site, it's a website, it's called fujitsugeneral.zendesk.com. And Ricky is an expert with that site, the fujitsugeneral.zendesk.com. And the reason why I'm telling you to go there, if you open that site up, and you click on Halcyon, then you scroll down the screen, you will see videos on all the testing that we've done and videos on how to take this head apart. 
So stuff you can go to the review and uh, and practice. All right, so it's always a good thing to do. All right, so how do we take this unit apart if I have to clean it? Well, let's figure out why we had to clean it in the first place. Because generally, when you install our equipment, you really only have to check the indoor unit for cleanliness really every two years. But if I have to go there because my fan wheel is caked up with a lot of junk, gentlemen, what you have to do is check to see the hole that you brought the line set through. And it may have been sealed from the outside or it may not have, but it also has to be sealed on the inside. So we want to seal both sides of that hole because remember I told you that this indoor fan never shuts off as long as the unit's got power. And I could be sucking in outdoor air all day long. That also means I could be sucking in debris, moisture, dirt, pollen that is going to end up building up on the wheel and that's going to cause a service call. If there's some foul smells flowing through the house and even the outdoor side has been um, sealed, the indoor side may not be. And Rob and I were really recently on a job that was having some issues and the outside was sealed, but not the inside. And it came through the side of the house and then went through the attic before it got into the room. So it got to that knee well and then came into the room. So now we were open to the attic. So any smells or any debris, any dust, actually fiberglass particles, we found all over on the indoor unit. So seal it on the inside and the outside. Even if you got a job where you're coming through a knee wall like that through the attic, make sure you're sealed at that knee wall too. All right, so how do I take this apart? Let's go through the process. Well, obviously this is gonna be up on the wall. And believe it or not, on the wall is easier than how I'm doing it right now. So we're gonna open the door. And gentlemen, don't grab and rip, all right? You got your two hinges here on the side. I'm gonna press them in and the door lifts off. So that's simple, that's easy, okay? I'm gonna take out my filters. Filters come over the side. All right, filters are gonna fall. On the bottom here, you will see these three holes, okay? They be covered, they will be covered with a plastic white clip. So with a flathead screwdriver, I can pop those off. I'll see three screws here on the bottom. I remove those screws. So for time's sake, I already took them out. Looking at this unit this way, you will see I've got two screws on the side for these side caps. Don't have to touch those, leave them alone. Some of our units, it's molded in, so there's no screw there to begin with, so you don't have to touch it. But leave these screws alone, you don't have to touch them. But what you're gonna see, is I'm going to have a screw here. This has to be removed. I'm going to have a screw here. This has to be removed. So I already loosened them up so I can remove them nice and easy. So they're out of the way. Now here's my electrical control box. Again, let me put this up. So I have a screw there. I'm going to remove that screw. So I did that already for time's sake. Remove the electrical control box. Now if I look inside, I don't know, Chris, if you can zoom in or not. Nice, very nice. You'll see right here, there's a screw hole. So I've already taken out that screw. That screw would come out. So now I've taken out all the screws that could possibly be holding this cover on. Here's the hard part right now, because now this unit's up on the wall. And depending on how it's installed, you could be four inches off the ceiling. I have to find two clips. And I'm going to turn the unit this way so you can see it. So there's going to be a clip here and there's gonna be a clip right here. And it's gonna be very tempting if you can't see it to go in there with a flathead screwdriver. You all got a nice long flathead screwdriver. And if I go in there with that screwdriver, be really, really careful because if I pry and I pry incorrectly, I can snap the clip. So we'll definitely get the cover off and when we put it back on, it's never gonna sit well. So I need to pop those clips. So if I pop the clips, if you can get in with your finger and pop the clips, okay, I lost the clip, there we go. Pop the clip. Now I'm wrestling this with by myself. All right, so the clip has been popped. Probably want to run my hand underneath to loosen it up. 
and then I can lift the cover off. What am I connected to here? Got all my screws out, boys. What's going on? Huh? Am I caught on the louver? I'm caught on something. There we go. Here we go. And now the cover lifts off in one piece. Okay? Again, it is easier hanging up on the wall. I'm wrestling with it here on the table. All right. So now at this point, how do I get this apart? So right over here on this side is my electrical panel. I've got a couple of screws there I've got to remove. So I'm gonna take a screw off here. Robbie, why didn't you bring a screw gun? You're not supposed to use screw guns on those, Jimbo. There you go, baby. So I take out the two screws here on the electrical panel side. Take off the electrical panel. Now, right here, I'm going to turn this this way so you can see it. Here's the side of the unit, and I've got all these wires here. These are fine wires, so we want to unplug them. They all have Molex plugs. This is the plug that goes to my thermistors. All right, other plugs that go onto the circuit board here. Unplug them. They only fit where they come out of, okay? You may want to take a picture before. This harness right here, this is the harness to the fan motor itself. Be aware of its placement, how it comes through on the bottom, all right, through this particular hole, because when you replace the fan motor, if you turn the fan motor, the harness can now be on the top, and now you'll pinch it when you try to put the unit back together. So you don't want to do that. You want to make sure you put the fan motor in so the harness is underneath and going through the same hole. So I would unplug this from the board, right? Move that out of the way. Move these other wires out of the way. I got two more thermistors here to unplug. Okay. I can move these wires out of the chase way. Nice and simple. Easy does it. So you don't destroy anything. Okay, get them off to the side. All right, and I've got a screw. Where's my screw? It's going to be this one here. I'm going to unscrew this screw. Is that the right one, Rick? I know we will find out, won't we? No, if it was the wrong one, I always do that. It's the one on the bottom. My bad, gents. All right. Now be aware with these screws, we're screwing into plastic, so don't be really aggressive and make sure things go in nice and straight. Okay, so now I can lift this off. I've got a ground screw here that I'm going to remove. Don't break the ground wire. Okay, and now I can get my electrical panel off to the side. Okay. So now at this point, I've got a screw here and a screw here. So we only have four screws now holding the whole unit together. We're going to take off this screw. Same thing here on the bottom. And take off that screw. On the other side, I've got two more screws. We're going to take them off. Again, we got video so you can watch this, but it's pretty simple. And don't lose the screws, <laughs> as you can hear one rattling around. All right. So everything is off to the side. So now at this point, Around, I can lift the unit right out of 
Here. Usually somebody plays the ball when I do this in a classroom. Here we go. So what happens is the bottom is going to fall out into your hands. The coil is going to stay hanging on the wall. So you're probably going to have to um, disconnect the condensate line. That may happen. Depending on how you install it, you're probably going to have to disconnect the condensate line. And now at this point, I've exposed my fan motor. Here's my wheel. So for the sake of time, this screw right here would come out. This is holding this plastic piece, which is keeping the fan motor in place. Okay. Oh, why not? We'll just take it out. Rob's going to put this back together anyway. So we're going to take out that screw. Oh my gosh, Robbie, this one's on for good. We're going to wiggle off this black, this plastic piece. Okay. Now I can lift up the fan motor and the fan wheel. Really important at this point that I pay attention to this side because right here is I have a rubber grommet. So this is the unit, for, so when you take it apart, everything's stuck in there. There we go. This rubber grommet's really important because it just presses on to the fan wheel. I can move this around so you can see it better. See that fan wheel there? This is just going to press on here. This rubber grommet, it's got a special shape on it, so it's only going to fit into the groove one way. Be aware when you pull this up, this could be loose, this could fall off. And if it does fall off, it's black, it's plastic, it's soft, all right, and you're not going to hear it fall. First time we did this class, we lost one and we didn't even know it, all right? And when you lose it, gentlemen, you can put this back together, but it's going to be as noisy as heck. So be aware. So when you lift this up, look for this, make sure you don't lose it out in the field, all right? So at this point, here's my fan motor, okay? You can see how the harness is coming through, and I want to make sure I put the harness back the exact same way. I have a set screw on here. I can re uh, remove that and take off the actual wheel itself. If this was really badly uh, filled up with a lot of debris, you could take this off, take it outside, power wash it, clean it up, and then put it back together. If I've had to, gone, if I've had to go through all of this, you want to double check and ohm out the fan motor, which is in your service tips. We tell you how to do that. Ohm out the fan motor and make sure the fan motor is still good. If I'm replacing any of the circuit boards that we went over today, always double check if it's on the outdoor unit or the indoor unit, the fan motor on that particular piece of equipment. Ohm that out and make sure the fan motors are good. What could happen, one thing we found out in the field is if the fan motor went bad or went out of calibration for some reason and now was not operating properly. That could give some wonky voltage and end up taking out some of the circuit boards. So you've got a piece of equipment. It's been installed for five, six years. Everything's been working well, no issues. And all of a sudden we start losing uh, circuit boards. Check corresponding fan motors. If the fan motors are bad, that's what probably took out the circuit board. So write this down anytime i replace any circuit board i also want to check corresponding fan motors to make sure they're within tolerance so we have no issues moving forward all right any questions on that rick mm -hmm. rob since you guys are here anything you want to add i know this is an etsd speed date but it's a lot of fun we seem to cover everything we can cover anything to add gentlemen all right, any questions out there in the field? Because, gentlemen, you got the two of the best Fujitsu guys here with me today. We can answer anything. Get familiar with Zendesk. Get familiar with Zendesk. I don't know if you guys heard, Rick. Get familiar with Zendesk. We use it a lot. So if we're out there with you or talking with you on the phone, you give us model and serial number. We as TSAs are able to create history on that unit. So let's say a year or two later, somebody had to go back for another problem. There's history, so we can all see what that was. Was there something changed? Was there something that you had to replace? What have you? 
and we can see that history, as can Fujitsu technicians. All right. Anything? I see some fingers moving, but no questions. Bring it back in the chat box. All right. So we completed our class. It's 9.34. Not bad, huh, guys? All right. Got that all done in an hour and a half. If there are no other questions, I thank you very much. Our next class is going to be this Thursday. It's Fujitsu Wi-Fi, correct? Got it. All right, Fujitsu Wi-Fi, and Rick is come, uh, handling that class. So come back Thursday, uh, 8 o'clock, for Fujitsu Wi-Fi components. And uh, if you want to see any of the videos that we have produced, you can go to whalesdarby.com, click on the training tab, and that will take you to HVAC Insiders. And from there, you can see any of the webinars that we've produced, or you can go directly to hvacinsiders.com. Uh, and again, you can see any of the webinars that we have been producing since this pandemic started. So if there are no other questions, I thank you very much for your time today. And hopefully we see you out in the field helping you sell a Fujitsu system. All right. So thank you very much.